Welcome to Pure Meta Episode 1. This is your go-to resource for crafting the ultimate gaming setups for Tarkov. In this series, I'm taking you through every step of building high-powered gaming beasts from selecting the right hardware to fine-tuning your settings for maximum performance. So I'll start by walking you through the hardware selection process, making sure you get the most bang for your buck. Then we'll dive into the nitty gritty of actually assembling your PC, covering everything from installing components to configuring the BIOS and setting up windows. Then I'll also guide you through optimizing your system with third party applications and tweaking in-game settings to ensure smooth gameplay. On this setup, I'm using an AMD GPU, so I will be going through adrenaline settings. In future videos, I'll use an Nvidia card so I can show you the Nvidia control panel settings as well. Lastly, but very importantly, I'll share what to do if you need some tech support and you run into some issues and require troubleshooting. So whether you're gearing up for some intense PvP in Tarkov or you're just looking to maximize your gaming experience, I've got you covered. So sit back, relax, and let's build the gaming rig of your dreams. I chose to use the Height Revolt 3 for this build. It's compact, it looks futuristic, it looks clean, it has a cool carrying handle so it's very portable, and its footprint is very small. I purchased the case with the 700 watt PSU bundle included, and I got it for under $120. I've seen the sale come around very often, so be on the lookout for that if you're looking at this case. For the motherboard, I'm going with an ASRock B550M ITX AC. It's currently going for about $130 right now on Amazon. CPU is a no-brainer. I'm going with the 5700X3D. If you have access to a 5600X3D, that is even better in my opinion. But those aren't widely available. So I went with the 7 Series here. In order to start building in the Revolt 3, you got to take off the side panels, which is very easy to do, like so. Next, we're going to put it on its back, pull up the front panel, get these wires out of the way, and then it helps to install the USB front connector, the front panel connector, and the audio header first before inserting the motherboard. It will usually take a little maneuvering. If you travel often and you're used to kind of pushing your stuff down so you can pull that zipper through, it's kind of the same thing here. These are the four mounting screw positions. Next, I've got 32 gigs of G-Skill Rip Jaws 3600 CL16 DDR4 here. Handling cooling, I've gone with the ID Cooling Low Profile IS55, dropping in the standoffs and the mounting brackets here. The X3Ds are perfect for ITX builds because they run so cool while gaming, allowing you to run very compact coolers with tiny footprints. I've gone with an inland QN322 2TB Gen 3 NVMe here. With ITX builds, it's very important the order that you install components, so make sure you do the M2 before you do the cooler because you won't have access to it otherwise. Next, I'm going to connect the CPU EPS connector and then the motherboard ATX24 pin connector. Handling graphics, I've got my trusty Hellhound 6650 XT here. This and the 6600 XT, which can be found for under $200, are still the best 1080 cards in my opinion. To give it some extra airflow, I dug up some NZXT AER2 140mm case fans. This will ensure there's good enough circulation in this configuration. Next, something you have to keep in mind is that the I.O. panel is located on the bottom side of the machine. So I went ahead and installed the Wi-Fi antenna and connected my HDMI cable before I stood the PC up. Alright, so here is the semi-finished build complete with the slick carrying handle for ultimate portability. It's like holding the power of a high performance rig in the palm of your hand. Now let's talk about ITX builds. There's just something inherently satisfying about them. For me, it's like a symphony of efficiency and elegance where every inch of space is meticulously utilized to create a powerhouse that punches way above its weight. So it's not just about cramming components together, it's about crafting a masterpiece of compact computing. And it's a testament to the beauty of minimalist engineering. It's something I can't fully explain, but I'm really drawn to. To install Windows, get a USB flash drive, preferably 16 gigs or lower. 
go to the Windows Media Creation Tool download link. I have it in the video description. Run the application, create a removable USB bootable drive using the Media Creation Tool. If you don't have access to another PC, ask a friend to do it maybe. Insert the USB drive into the front panel. Hit the power button and start mashing the delete button, get into the BIOS. This is the main menu, I'm gonna hit left. Scroll down to the UEFI boot option. Force it to boot from there. You will boot into the Windows installation UEFI. I'm gonna hit install now. Once we get into the interface, it's gonna ask you for a product key. Go ahead and hit, I don't have a product key for now. Or if you have one handy, go ahead and enter it now. You can do this later too. I'm on Windows 11 Pro. I'm going to go through the privacy agreements, select the drive, hit new, enter, let it do its thing, complete the installation, and it's going to boot into the Windows welcome screen. From here, hit shift F10 and type in OOBE backslash bypass NRO to bypass the Microsoft account sign in option. It's going to restart. You can hit yes, next, skip. And on the network selection area, you'll now have an option that says, I don't have internet and continue with limited setup. This is how you can set up a local account. Enter your PC name here. I'm going to call this Pure Meta Build 1080. Something I don't see a lot of people mention is turning off all these services. These are things that run in the background and are going to eat up resources without you knowing. Initialize into Windows for the first time. Hit the start menu key and type in Windows Update. Search for updates and allow it to download and install everything that's available and pops up, okay? After you do that, you're most likely gonna have to restart. And after that initial first round of updates, if you go hit Windows key, type in Windows Update and search for updates again, you will most likely see that there are another round of updates available. So go ahead and let those all complete until you get to that settings menu, hit search for updates and no updates populate for you. Next, I'm gonna update my BIOS, go to Google, type in my motherboard name. Usually the manufacturer's site will pop up and they all have the same format pretty much. You go to the product page, hit support and there's a BIOS link. I'm gonna download the latest official link, not the beta. So I'll get the global version and download it here. Then I extract the BIOS file and put it onto a USB drive on the root directory. Insert the USB drive, restart the machine and start hitting the delete key to get into BIOS. Back at the ASRock BIOS, I'm gonna hit the right arrow three times, go over to the tools menu and hit the instant flash option. Select the file on the USB drive and let it do its thing. It's going to take a few minutes. Make sure you don't restart or power off the system while this is occurring. So I have restarted it one more time going back into the BIOS. Now we can see that I am on version P3.4. So now I'm going into the BIOS setup for the 5700X3D. I'm going to load the XMP profile on these sticks, which happens to be 3600CL16. Go down to Infinity Fabric Frequency and Dividers, set it to the same frequency as the memory. Remember that DDR means double data rate. So if they're rated at 3600 mega transfers per second, that means the clock is actually running at 1800 megahertz. Next, in order to enable resizable bar or SAM, you need to disable CSM on this motherboard. So I'm gonna tab over to the boot header, go down to CSM, disable it, Go back to PCI configuration and now I am able to enable above 4G decoding and resizable bar support. Next I'm going to run a minus 30 PBO undervolt. So I'm going to go into the AMD overclocking menu. I'm going to select PBO, change it to advanced, change the PBO limits to motherboard. Go down to curve optimizer, select all cores, negative for the sign. And then I'm going to enter a value of 30 for the magnitude. Then just save and exit. So the system is booting up, that's a good sign. 
looks like the BIOS settings were compatible with the hardware. I'm going to open up the task manager real quick and ensure that the memory is running at the right speed. It is, and it's detecting 32 gigs as well. Next, what I like to do is get rid of all the bloatware that comes with Windows. I don't need any of these applications. Pick and choose what you'd like to have on here, but the less, the better. Next, this is just my own preference, but I cannot stand Microsoft Edge. So the first thing I do is get past its annoying prompts and then download Google Chrome. Once that's installed, I like to replace it as the default browser, which Windows tries to stop you from doing at every step. So you need to individually select it for every file extension type. Another highly overlooked setting in my opinion is enhanced pointer precision from Windows. Basically it adds an acceleration algorithm to your mouse movements, so you don't want that for gaming. More overlooked settings in Discord. I always disable my game overlay and turn off hardware acceleration. If you have performance issues and have Chrome open in the background often, consider turning this setting off. Now we're going to install GPU drivers. I'm going to Google 6650 XT drivers, go to the AMD website, hit the Windows 11 download link. Once that's done, I'll run it and install the drivers, do a clean install, restart the machine. Next up is Process Lasso. I'm going to download and install it from the Bitsum website. By default, it installs as a startup app. So if you don't want it to start up with your machine every time you boot up, make sure you check this, ask startup and scope. I select do not start at login and have it launched by the GUI when it's run. Once we're back up, we're gonna go ahead and go to escapefromtarkov.com and download the BSG launcher installer. Run the launcher installer and then from there we'll need to download the game. Open up the launcher, download, and install Escape from Tarkov. Here are my GPU tuning AMD Adrenaline settings for the 6650 XT. And here are my specific game settings for Escape from Tarkov. I run anti-lag, image sharpening at 100, and enhanced sync from the basic menu. I turn off AMD free sync. I run a custom color profile with brightness at 25, saturation at 125, and display color enhancement selected to vivid gaming. In the advanced section, I use anisotropic filtering and set the level to 16, and then texture filter quality I set to high and enable surface optimization. Moving on to in-game settings in the first menu, I select polychrome for health color scheme. 63 FOV, head bobbing to 0.2 minimum. These are the graphics settings I'm running on the 6650 XT. It's pretty much my pure 60 optimized preset. Post FX, I don't run. I prefer to change the color through the AMD Adrenaline control panel. I use binaural audio now. I can't really tell the difference, but supposedly it's better. I have a video going over why I select the settings that I do, but basically it comes down to these are the optimal settings for performance and value for this configuration. Also have a keybinds video explaining why I set up my keybinds the way I do. So check that out if you're interested, but here are my keybinds. Earlier we installed Process Lasso. I've got it open now and what I'm gonna do is set the CPU priority to always high. Then we'll set CPU affinity to disable SMT. For IO priority, always high. For memory priority, always normal. Lastly, by default, it's on Pro Balance enabled. I turn it to performance mode enabled. So we've built the PC, we've configured it, we've optimized it, and now we're ready to go onto the streets of Tarkov. So here we are. As you can see, the colors look great. There's no motion blurring. I'm averaging somewhere around 100 and even above 100 FPS it looks like. So it looks great, it runs great, feels smooth and responsive. I'd be very happy with this performance as is. But since I'm using an RX 6000 card and I'm getting around 100 FPS, I decided to try and test fluid motion frames on this setup as well. The FPS ranged from about 140 to 190 and it still felt very responsive as you can see here. There wasn't much input lag. It is slightly noticeable, so it's not perfect, but it definitely feels playable. It's still responsive. It still feels pretty crisp. 
and the visual effect as well as the motion clarity is definitely on another level so in my opinion it's worth trying out it won't be for everyone but it's cool that we have more and more options next i took this configuration out to woods and was just impressed by the visuals and the performance this is my aoc 24 gs2 it's a pretty budget-friendly 1080-144 Hz monitor. I've seen it go for between $70 to $80 sometimes with the right sale. So really impressed with the performance of this panel when paired with the right hardware and using the right settings. With this being an ITX build, I optimized the settings to favor efficiency and performance. So I capped the frame rate at 144 FPS and it mostly stays locked at that max frame rate. So the gameplay is very smooth. The 1% low is very high. As we know, when you go into the inventory, it will pull that 1% average number down. So the running FPS and 1% averages are gonna be lower than the actual in-game. But going into inventory is a huge part of the game. So that's why I include it in my benchmarks. If you wanna get an idea of the frame rates you'll see and the frame times, just look at the running frame time number and the current FPS number in different areas. In terms of temperature, you can see that the 5700X3D is running extremely cool in the high 40s, low 50s. The IS55 low profile cooler running just at 1600 RPM is handling the cooling without any issues. So I wanted to compare performance when there's no hard cap on the FPS and really there wasn't that much thermal or noise difference, maybe a couple percent on the GPU. That's about it. So in this setup, I might just run fully uncapped instead of at 144 going forward. The way I do that is by enabling enhanced sync in AMD Adrenaline. In terms of noise levels, I'm at about 35 decibels near the camera and in the mid 40s near the PC itself. So that about covers everything you should need to know from start to finish for building a 1080 rig for Tarkov in 2024. However, if you run into any issues or have any questions, then an easy way to get in touch with me is to click on any of my videos and in the video description, you'll see a link to my Discord. Our community is growing daily, and we've grown to over 600 members now. So feel free to join the Purology community. There's a channel called Ask Puri where I will directly answer questions. And there are plenty of very knowledgeable and friendly users within every channel. You can also feel free to message me directly. I'm happy to have a conversation and answer any questions that you might have. I just wanted to take a moment to express my gratitude for each and every one of you who has taken the time to view, like, or comment on my content. Every single interaction, no matter how small or big, means the world to me. It's these little steps that keep me motivated on this journey towards making content creation my full-time endeavor. Your support fuels my passion and gives me the drive to keep pushing forward even when it gets really tough to do so. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything you do. Your encouragement means more to me than I can express through words. So it's time for me to dive back into the grind and work on creating more informative, better content for you all to enjoy. So I can't wait to share everything I'm working on and I hope to see you in the next one.